last last year um we did a series of um talks at pension b about the history of anti-racism um and i spoke then about about two kind of anti-racist movements in britain separated by a few hundred years, couple of hundred years. One was the movement against the slave trade, which resulted in the abolition of slavery. Um, but the other one I spoke about was um, um, the, uh, the movement against the National Front in the 1970s and the role of Rock Against Racism and the Anti-Nazi League in, um, in defeating the, the National Front, which was the major, the major kind of fascist and racist party. Um, operating in Britain at the time in the 1970s. Um, what I wanted to say a little bit about today um, is a kind of follow on to that really, um, looking at the the successor organisation to the National Front. The National Front kind of fell apart and split into various pieces in the 80s. Um, but by the, by the 90s, the early 90s in particular, um, had kind of uh most of its stalwarts had moved to a new organization called the british national party the bnp um and they were very much uh, a fascist organization in much the same mold as the nf um and uh but they later mutated into something slightly different um and the other thing that i wanted to mention was like my own little small minor role in all of this because um during the the 2000s which is when most of what i want to talk about took place um i was intermittently uh involved in campaigning against the bmp typically usually as a press officer for anti-nazi organizations or anti-fascist organizations so um so, so i wanted to say a little bit about like you know um the sort of view from the I saw from my kind of little vantage point in, in, in the press office. This this picture I think was taken in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, there's one chap you might be able to see standing near the front of the march. Um, that guy is called John Tyndall um, and he was quite a leading National Front activist at the time and he later um, set up the BMP um uh once the national front had splintered um and as i mentioned the B the bmp were were very much a similar kind of group to the national front they were very into marches with flags um they were quite thuggish um they were quite openly openly fascist like they would do nazi salutes on their 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 marches so when you said the bmp are fascists and nazis you could just like point to them and it was it was pretty obvious what they were um they nevertheless managed to get to get uh um to get a councillor elected in the area of london that i live in which is um um tower hamlets um just in east east london um and they they got that offer. I don't, I don't really want to kind of go into that into, into a lot of detail, but the um, the guy, the, the councillor they got elected, Derek Beacon in 1992, was was driven out uh, shortly afterwards um, by quite a quite a big campaign on the ground here in Tower Hamlets that really pushed the BNP out of East London. Um, I moved to East London in 1995, about three, three, four years later. Um, and I was quite surprised at like how friendly it was compared to like Surrey where I grew up or anywhere else I'd been. And it, it took me a little while that, to sort of twig that the reason things felt like quite chilled out in the East End is because there had been this, you know, the, um, the, the organised fascists and racists who were operating the area had been driven out by a mass campaign really. Um, now. What happened after that was um, um, was is what I, I, I really wanted to talk about in a bit more bit more detail because um, in the early two thousands the BMP again started getting electoral victories it started picking up councillors um, and so of course people had to start to campaign against them but um, in the meantime it had changed slightly and so our our techniques of of campaigning against them also had to be had to alter and change a bit. Um, 
the main thing that happened is in 1999, uh, this character, uh, Nick Griffin, uh, took over the BMP, kicked out John Tyndall, um, and took over the BMP himself, um, and proceeded to take the organisation in a slightly different direction, away from this kind of, you know, marches and flags and Nazi salutes and thuggery that had characterised the organisation in the 90s. Um, in particular, uh, Nick Griffin took his inspiration from France, where Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was the um, the leader of the Front National, the, the, the largest French fascist organisation, um, had managed to get the Front National essentially to get a kind of foothold into mainstream politics. Um, and this is despite the fact that the Front National's um, history and background were Vichy collaboration in the Second World War. You know, these people were Nazis. There's, there was no real, real doubt about it. But they'd managed to get a foothold into mainstream French politics by very cleverly hiding where they were coming from. And, um, and they, you know, being, being French, they had, they had their own intellectuals, like Nazi intellectuals, who would work out how to, how to do this. And one of the things that they came up with is that they could no longer explicitly talk about race. Um, whereas the National Front of the 70s would basically say, there ain't no black in the Union Jack, um, white power, pitch everything in terms of being, uh, being quite openly racist. Um, uh, Le Pen and the Front National and the, the BMP under Griffin started to hide all of that language and, and pitch everything in terms of kind of cultural identity, um, marginalised native communities being, being ignored, you know, essentially take on the, um, the language of what we would nowadays call identity politics and use it to disguise their far right and racist policies. Um, and Le Pen had done that very, very successfully and had managed to appear respectable enough to kind of get enough mainstream coverage to to, to make the, the Front National quite a, a powerful organisation. And his 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 daughter to this day, the, the, the organisation is renamed, but his daughter is still like the, 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 um, the Front National successor organisation is still a major, major force in French, French politics, unfortunately. Um, so Griffin's idea was to try to do the same thing here in Britain, um, and it was it was initially by by about two thousand and two it was beginning to to, to reap dividends. Um, in particular, in two thousand and two, um, the BNP got three councillors in Burnley in 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 um, in, uh, uh, in 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 Lancashire, um, and. Uh, about that time, I was uh, um, getting quite active politically and getting active as a campaigner um, and worked for uh, for about six months or so for the the anti-Nazi League, which was one of the one of the many organizations campaigning against the BNP at the time. Um, one of the things I, I had to do there because they, they discovered that I could do I could do websites or I sort of understood websites. So so um, this is from the, the Internet Wayback Machine. It is uh, a page that I coded in 2002 by typing it into into a into a, a text editor and uploading it straight onto the internet. You didn't have anything fancy back in those days. If you wanted to write a website, you'd have to like type it all out yourself. Um, but anyway, that, that, that's, that's what, what websites and looked like in 2002. Uh, I just, it's not really fitting into my uh, <laughs> narrative very much, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd show it off because it's, it's still there somewhere up on the internet. Um, but you can see that um, our, our, um, our campaigning back then was still very much based on picking on clear individuals in the BMP that we could very easily make the argument that these people are are, are fascists and Nazis, they're Hitler lovers, they're racists, and show people evidence of that and basically make the argument that they're not really part. Ah oh, yes, Mark Collett, yes, he was he was one of that 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 lot back then. Um now, the, the problem was we found that this didn't really work anymore. And the reason for that was, was several things. Um, 
partly it was because um, while while Nick Griffin's makeover of the BMP was was paper thin, if you just kind of scratched beneath the surface, you'd see that it was exactly the same people. Nick Griffin himself had a long history of Holocaust denial, of photos of him wearing swastika T-shirts. You know, you could you could make the argument if you if you pressed it, if you looked into his background and you looked beyond the sort of things he was saying. But most most of the mainstream press wasn't really interested in doing that. They 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 took Griffin's claims that the new BMP was uh, put its racist fascist days behind it, it was now a respectable organization, more or less at face value. Um, uh, the, the BMP themselves um, stopped doing marches, stopped doing public meetings, stopped doing anything where um, you know, someone with a camera or a microphone might be able to actually reveal who they really were. Um, and that was quite clever on their part. Um, it meant that it, it was quite hard for us to make the argument that, about what these people really were. Um, and the other reason that it was it was difficult to do is that um, the BMP were latching on to two two particular kinds of racist arguments that were actually very popular or common in in respectable British society. Um, one of them was attacking Muslims, and you know this is 2002, was shortly after 9/11, and the notion that like Muslims were like some sort of you know major threat to British civilization and to Western civilization and they were all crazy terrorists etc etc was something that um, wasn't just being said by um, people like Nick Griffin who has uh, you know a history as long as your arm of Holocaust denial and fascism and Hitler worship it was also being said by respectable mainstream commentators so um, basically the BMP kind of piggybacked off the back of that. The other kind of racism that um, they deployed a lot that was also very very common in 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 like you know respectable opinion and the the the, the broadsheet press was attacks on asylum seekers and refugees which um, um, well there were an absolute fever pitch back then you know you see a bit of that nowadays you know you get the footage of um of uh, of those boats with migrants coming over the channel and you know there, there's 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 arguments about that in the press at the moment but i think nowadays there is there is a degree of sympathy for uh migrants that really wasn't the case 20 years ago 20 years ago these people were just being you know there was just a moral panic about bogus asylum seekers coming over here and you know ripping off our benefits or whatever crazy stuff um and the bmp used used that a lot again they they sort of piggybacked off a kind of respectable kind of racism to start pushing all of the other stuff that had become unfashionable or harder for them to say publicly like anti-black racism you know and anti-jewish racism and so on um so that's that that was a situation we found ourselves in um we did various things to campaign against them one of them was to um set up music festivals multiracial music festivals um we did a big one in manchester in 2002 um headlined by the then up and coming singer and rapper Ms. Dynamite. Um, and there was one that one, uh, one um, uh, a co colleague of mine told me an interesting story about um, about uh, um, about about about, you know, going around Burnley and put, handing out flyers for this, this this free festival. And there was these three young girls who Three young white girls who, who who picked up these flyers and were very excited to see like you know miss dynamite who was super cool at the time was coming to do a a concert in 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 in, in manchester down the, down down the road but um and then the two two of them just turned to the third one and said oh but you can't go and the third one was like what do you mean i can't go so look it's an anti-racist festival it's against the bmp and you're a bmp supporter you're a racist so you can't go and see miss dynamite and you know um, that kind of brutal peer pressure, I think, was was very effective in terms of us winning over um, certainly young people in these areas to to, to a kind of anti BMP, anti racist kind of position, um, and that that I think was was very useful. But 
part of the problem was that didn't really touch um, the people who were voting for the BNP, who tended to be older um, and tended to basically kind of fall for the BNP's facade of respectability that it had put up. Um, and we were still trying to work out how to how to um, um, to break past that, really. Uh, it, it wasn't at all obvious. Um, anyway, um, what happened next? Well, I went off and did various other jobs. Um, and over the over the following years, uh, the BNP slowly ticked up in terms of getting seats in councils, uh, dotted about the country, all sorts of odd little places, some of them were places where historically the National Front had always done well, like in the outskirts of Leicester, for instance, um, you know. But other places were just like completely new areas where there'd never really been any kind of organised fascist or racist presence. You know, that doesn't mean to say people weren't racist, but there was never organisations trying to actually foment that. Um, one time I remember uh, um, we saw that the, a BMP councillor had been elected in Broxbourne in Hertfordshire, which is like a really leafy suburb of, of Hertfordshire. And we were like, you know, how did this happen? And basically, the guy had just like put out leaflet after leaflet saying, I'm going to stop the asylum seekers, you know, trading off the back of this anti-asylum seeker, anti-refugee sentiment that was everywhere in the press at the time. Of course, you know, uh, we found out that there were precisely zero asylum seekers who'd been sent to Broxbourne. Um, so, you know, th th this idea that Broxbourne was overrun with asylum seekers was completely mythical. Yet, nevertheless, he, he managed to he managed to trade off it and get get a seat. Um, and then, really, uh, um, the the crux point happens uh, in like two thousand and nine um, when there was the uh, the European. Oh, sorry, one other important thing in two thousand and six um, in barking in East London, a bit, bit further east from where I am now, um, the BMP got a, a lot of seats at the council election, I think it was about 12, and uh, became the official opposition to Labour. Um, and that had a really chilling effect because A, this was, this was like the outskirts of London, um, it was a multiracial area. Uh, we tried putting on, um, like, you know, anti-racist gigs, things like that. No venue in Barking in the actual borough would take us. Um, and it, that little detail really struck me because it showed how the fact that the BMP had, had installed themselves as the official opposition in Barking had had a completely chilling effect across all civic institutions in the borough. Like, basically, anyone who was an anti-racist was scared to do anything and anyone who was a bit racist was was confident and strutting about. Um, so that was the situation. And in two thousand and nine, um, things kind of reached a bit of a bit, bit, bit of a climax. In that there was, um, and at that point, um, the Anti Nazi League had folded into um, another organisation. It emerged with various other anti fascist organisations to to create uh, something called Unite Against Fascism. And for a while, I was the press officer for them. Um, and in the European elections, uh, basically, b partly because of PR, um, the uh, uh, the BMP managed to get two Euro MPs elected, Nick Griffin um, and one other guy. And of course, this was the point at which, um, like, they they this is their chance to really do what Le Pen had done in France um, many years previously and enter into and establish themselves as a mainstream political force in Britain, which is the one thing that we were we were really trying to stop. Um, and there was a big argument because the BBC, in their wisdom, decided to invite Nick Griffin onto Question Time, which, you know, uh, was seen as a sort of, you know, seal, seal of approval that this guy is now like, you know, a respectable elected politician. He's now part of the mainstream. You have to include him on 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 um on programs like this so uh one of the things we we did with uaf was um uh we we organized a big counter demonstration against 
question time. So we did, the BBC was based out in West London um, at the time. And so we put out a lot of propaganda about, because partly because the press was kind of interested in who the Nick Griffin character was. And so we would go to them and present them the history, uh, you know, his quotes from the 80s and 80s and 90s, um, really horrible things that he was saying. Um, but he's certainly a lot of a lot of Holocaust denial propaganda, which Griffin was obsessed with in the 90s. Um, but also like begin to say this guy is not just uh, a politician, a typical politician with right of center or even racist views. There's something much deeper going on here. This guy is an actual fascist. His politics are in the lineage of Hitler. That's the way he understands himself, even if he won't say that publicly. Um, and you have to take the mask off. You have to rip the mask off. You can't take what he says at face value. He's a liar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've been trying to make that argument um, for a while as part of pulling down this facade of respectability. But um, it, people began to listen around that point. Um, and the other thing we did was we had this big demo uh, outside Question Time. Um, there's a picture of it here, um, and uh, it was quite it was quite interesting. It was a bit of, it was a bit of a you know it was a bit crazy as these dem demonstrations tend to be. Um, and uh, but one effect of it was was that the next morning when you looked at the papers you didn't just see pictures of Nick Griffin's mug on each paper. You also saw pictures of lots and lots of people protesting against him and being very angry. And that sense of opposition to him that you could see on the TV, you could see kind of filtered its way, I think, um, into, into the Question Time audience because um, he had quite a hostile questioning from the audience. Um, much more so than than you would normally expect from something like that and also uh didn't perform very well um so you know he kind of it wasn't really the great triumph that he was he was looking for i'd say it was probably a bad day for him uh, and the papers certainly the next day the overall message was one of one of opposition to him more than anything else um there were other things we did that um that i don't really have time to talk about um there was like a, a neo-nazi festival that the bmp would organize each year in derbyshire which we managed to get a big demonstration surround it and essentially shut it down um there were legal challenges to the bmp from the equalities commission um which was successful which you know cost them a lot of money uh, and, and um, and i think was quite also quite an important factor and essentially all this pressure suddenly started to pile on the, onto the organization. Um, and it began to buckle and wilt under that pressure. And I think the final thing that happened, the coup de grace really, um, was in 2010, when um, uh, the council elections came up again. And um, we basically put a lot of effort really into going around knocking on doors and embarking and doing, you know, going door to door. Um, working with with other parties, um, working working with the Labour Party, but not actually. You know, the Labour Party were out getting people out to vote Labour, but what we did was basically get the lists of people who said that they were going to go and vote for the BNP, and go round, knock on their doors, and say, "You do realise these people are fascists? You do realise they're Nazis?" Now, you know. Often we wouldn't get a very uh, very good reception for for saying that, and often people would be sceptical or or hostile to what, what we were saying. But it was quite important because you could get people who were quite reactionary, quite bigoted, believed all the rubbish in the press about Muslims and asylum seekers, but kind of would draw the line at like voting for someone who was an explicit fascist, an explicit Nazi, an explicit supporter of Hitler and if you could get across to them that that's who this guy really was you could at the very least persuade them not to vote you know um <clears throat> and that that door knocking uh, with lots and lots of activists basically did that and it, I think it was quite crucial in in um uh, in knocking out Griffin uh knocking out the 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 the, the BMP um because I remember on the day of the council election um uh, there were there were tellers, you know. So we had a we had an idea of how things were going, and basically in the evening when people got back from work, 
um, the BNP vote collapsed uh, and we could see that lots and lots of people were coming out to vote and voting against the BNP. Um, and they lost all their seats. They lost every single council seat that they picked up in 2006, total wipeout. Um, and uh, uh, also that year, uh, Nick Griffin stood against Margaret Hodge in, uh, for, in the general election and again uh, got, got, got wiped out. Uh, he, he got beaten. Um, and that really was the final, the final blow to them. And the, the organisation just kind of collapsed in acrimony and split. Uh, much as the NF had done in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, after a similar amount of pressure was put to them. So it, it took a long time. It took, it took about 10 years of constant campaigning to go from the, the BNP first emerging in this new kind of respectable form into actually, you know, breaking them at the ballot box, break, you know, blocking them, preventing them from getting, getting any further. Um, but it turned out that that 2009 breakthrough was their high point and that they fell apart shortly afterwards. Um, I would say just like a couple of sort of takeaway points from this. First is that campaigning does work. It's hard. It takes a lot of time, but it, it does eventually does eventually get you somewhere if you, if you stick at it and you, you, you think about it strategically. Um, the other point I would make is that um, the sort of common or garden bigotries and uh, racism that you see that are in the mainstream media and are nowadays perhaps viewed as respectable. Maybe in 20 years time, people will look back on, on, on prejudices that are considered respectable these days and say, how could people ever believe that? You know, but it's those currently respectable prejudices are the ones that organizations that are out to rehabilitate all the old forms of racism, um, they will latch on to those currently respectable ones to try to push out the other ones. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, um, uh, uh, opposition to racism and defending minority communities in this country um, involves uh, more than just basically, uh, 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 you know, making the talking points for things that everyone kind of pays lip service to. Uh, you also have to take on some of the harder issues around asylum seekers and refugees and so on. Um, and if you don't take those on, um, organisations like the BNP will take advantage of that. And once they're implanted into somewhere, into a locality, um, they're quite hard to get rid of. So it's best to like not let them do that in the first place.